embroidery software line of D7 solutions and designs and machine embroidery. Our inspiration software line includes My Block Pacer, My Quilt Embellisher, Perfect Embroidery Pro, and Perfect Stitch Viewer. Tonight's webinar features our Perfect Embroidery Pro. We have a wonderful team assisting us tonight. Dory, Nancy, Chris, Bob, and Debbie. I would also like to mention that Nancy Schneider, the Vice President of Marketing, is with us tonight. And of course we have Tamara Evans, our speaker, who I will switch over to. Again, thank you for joining us and enjoying the webinar. And we will be offering the webinar on the website after it's finished being edited. Okay, Tamara? Thank you, Dory. And I will send this to you. Thank you. As we're waiting for Tamara okay. to pull up her screens and get everything ready, just the, the topic of this evening being terms of embroidery, you know, uh, it, the, the language of embroidery, it, you know, it can be just a simple word and, and it can be said in so many different ways but means the same. And, and the idea here is for us to all learn the lingo and just tackle those terms and, um, and we'll all learn to untangle that every element of every design. And Tamara Evans is the perfect person to do that for you this evening. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Tamara. Well, thank you, Nancy. And let's get started. I'm trying to move this little thing out of my way. I think that'll do it. As you can see, I've got a blank screen of design page up on my screen. What I want to do first is go through and show you each what the different stitches do and so you understand what the stitch is when it's in your sequence view. I'm going to click on manual and this is in digitizing mode. When, wherever I click on my screen when I'm doing a manual stitch is where the needle is going to penetrate the fabric. Okay, if I add my stitch points to this, you can see here the little dots are my stitch points. It doesn't have a stitch link. The only property, well let's select it with the select tool. The only properties that this has are the color, which is one, which I could change here or down here at the bottom of my screen where my color palette is. The start command, which is normal, and the end command, which is normal. That's it. Uh, and the size. I could change the size on it and rotate it and flip it. Other than that, there's, there's nothing to it. It is set, the stitch length is set by the digitizer. If you want some really long stitches, this is the way to do it. If you want to do a short little tie-in or tie-off and you don't want the uh, software to do it for you, that's what a manual stitch is for. You may use it to do some traveling underneath a fill or someplace where you don't care if the stitches are extra long or if you want to make them really small. And that's it. Now let me show you the second stitch is a run stitch. The run stitch will follow the same path kind of here as we did with the uh, manual stitch. The run stitch works very similar. When I'm done, I click. But you can see now that it put in stitch points all along there because my default stitch length for a run stitch is three millimeters. So it set these stitches three millimeters apart. So with this one, I'm going to have a big long jump stitch. With this one, the stitches will be um, at regular intervals. Now, with a run stitch, we can also take, let me select it, and convert that to several different things. A standard run stitch is just like I just drew here. It's just a single run. Um, it doesn't go back over itself or anything else. If I do a two-ply stitch and apply that, now it's going over it twice. And you can see that my um, thread shows up better here because I have um, it set in my tools options, which we'll go over in a little bit. I can also make a run stitch into a bean stitch. Now a bean stitch is actually um, typically a three-ply stitch. It goes forward, back, forward, forward, back, forward, kind of like a waltz step. 
But instead of just doing three repeats, we could go up to nine repeats of the same stitch and apply those. And now I have a very defined running stitch that's going to stand up more on the fabric. If I make it a longer stitch length, such as a four millimeter, it will stand up even more because let, with fewer, uh, with longer intervals between when the thread gets knotted underneath and pulled down into the fabric, it makes it stand up. Now the other stitch I can change to is a motif stitch. Now to see all of the motif stitches, you can either click the down arrow and scroll through them, or you can click, no you can't on this one, sorry, you click the down arrow and scroll through them. You can select any of these motif stitches and apply them. Now with this one, let's turn off our stitch points for a minute. It went up one side and then back down the other. I can modify the pattern length on a motif. So if you see one of these repeats of the loop up and down is the pattern length. If I make that smaller, such as a two, and apply it, then my stitches get smaller. I can also make that larger, like a, a 10, and apply it. And that makes it a little smoother, and it recalculates the stitch length for me. So I no longer am dealing with stitch length here. I just deal with pattern length. Now another feature in the motif stitch, let's change this one to here and apply that. Let's make it smaller so we can see it better in that area. Okay, so I have a two millimeter pattern length with this. I can also make it variable sized. So it can increase as it goes down the line or decrease as it goes down the line to convex or concave. Let's try concave, and the variable minimum is 70%, uh, so I don't want to go less than 70% of the original size of the pattern, which is 2 millimeters, and my max is 150. Now, I can change those either way. If I want to make that 25% and get really small, I can do that and apply. So you see here it starts out very, very small and then works it way its way up and then back as a small stitch. So that's concave, convex, starts big and goes small, and then linear increasing and decreasing, they go up and down. Uh, so that's what we can do with a motif stitch. Another option here is a symbol stitch. Now, if I click on the three dots, it will show you a menu of all of the different symbol stitches available. If I want to turn this run stitch into a row of candy canes, I can do that and apply. Now, that, <laughs> that also works with the linear increasing and decreasing. Let's just change that to none and click apply. And click apply again. Oh, no, now it's all the same length. I have a pattern length of 10 millimeters. Let's make that smaller. Let's do four and apply. So now it's a little bit smaller stitch, okay? Um, in addition to, and it doesn't look that good with the way I have that looped back. Let's make it two. So you can play around with the different sizes until you get it just the way you want. The other thing I can change my run stitch to is, cut, is uh, cut work. Now this is a new feature and the stitch length is set at a half of a millimeter as a default. If I apply that, then it doesn't look like anything but very, very, very tiny stitches. What happens in this case when I save it, it will save it at, in four different colors and the color uh, changes will indicate when you need to change your cut work needle, also known as a boring needle or a borer needle. So it bores a hole in that fabric and cuts it out. It's a very fun function if you're doing um, patches or things where you want to cut an outline around something and have it come out of the hoop. It works great. Okay, the next stitch let's do, let me go to a new page with that is our satin stitches. This particular satin stitch, um, I put in one side of the satin 
and if I hold down the control key and click, it makes my lines curved. Then when I get to the end of that side, I right click, and then I can come back. And I can be parallel to it, I can be really close to it, I can be further away, it matters not. When I get to the back again to that size, I right click and it makes my satin stitch for me. Let's look at that in 3D. Okay. Uh, now, properties with the satin stitch are a little bit different. I can make one side of it jagged over here. I could do or none, both, the first or the second. So the first would be the first side that I lay down and the jagged value, let's make it really bold, let's make it two millimeters and see what happens. Click apply. Oh, I've got to select it first. How many times have you done that? I do it a lot. Okay, so I'm going to make it the first side and then change the value. Let's make it three and click apply. Now you see how that makes a really jagged stitch. I can do that on one side, I can do that on both sides, um, either way. Now let's just click undo to go back where we were. The other option with my satin stitch is that I can split the satin stitch. I could do no split, I could do a percent slip, um, split so if I do that, I want to make this 30% um, distance, and I will deactivate the split if, it's, if the satin stitch is longer than 7 millimeters, and click Apply. Now you can't really see what happened until we look at it in 3D and zoom out a bit. Now you can see where it split the stitch here, okay, because it was longer than 7 millimeters. I could also take that and go back to my satin properties. I could make it an absolute split and say I want to split it at three millimeters and click apply. And now it's done it exactly at three millimeters from the edge. So there's lots of different looks you can get with this. I've done chevrons before with the satin stitch. Um, and I'll tell you what, let's do that with the next one. The same principle, I'm going to start here on one side and then I come down to the other side. So you're doing each side at the same time. Um, you're doing one side and then the other side. Oops, let me back. You can use your backspace key to erase one. I just want to go up two levels and then back down two and then I'm coming down two over here, and down two, and then up. So I'm just spacing it out evenly. And down, and down. And then I right click when I'm done. Now, we have a satin stitch set up. Uh, let's look at what properties we have here. Oh, let's take off the jagged edge and apply that. We don't want a jagged edge. And we want to split um, let's do a percentage and make it 50% and click apply. Now it looks like I've got two rows of satin stitching when I really only did one. If I want to change that split over here in my um, properties box for the column, I could also make it an absolute split. I could do it 50% or I could do it 10% on both sides and click apply. Ooh, but now here's what happens when your satin stitch is over seven millimeters. Let's go back, and this is not going to stitch out right when you see those gaps. Okay, let's go back and change our satin stitch to split the difference at twenty mm, percent and click apply. Now I have a nice full satin stitch. So whenever you see a satin stitch that has the gaps in it like that, it's not going to stitch out right and you need to either set it to split, which you can in the parameters, or um, come into as a default or come into your satin properties and have it um, split automatically for you. Okay, so that is the satin stitches. Um, so, Nancy, 
do we have any questions yet? We do have a few questions, actually, uh, that our educators and moderators have sent in. And the first question is, how can I, and this is from Michelle, Michelle Bazell, she says, how can I create a trim rather than a jump stitch if I'm not changing colors? Oh, okay. Well, that is all set up. That's a very good question. Um, you can set it up globally in your tools, general options. And I recommend that everybody take a look through this and set things up the way that they want them to run. Under machine, here's where I can activate a trim if it's longer than 30 millimeters. So I could change that to, that's just the default that's uh, set up with the software. If you want that to be a shorter distance, if you want that to be 10 millimeters, then it will activate a trim if your jump stitch is longer than that. Now you can also turn that off. Um, and there's several ways that you can do trims. You can also do it on lettering. You can go in and have it um, trim between each letter, between each word, and between, um, or at each line. What it won't do, is trim your thread if your machine doesn't have trimming capabilities. Then you need to do a color change. Um, a trim's not going to help you there. So uh, the trim here at 30 millimeters, if I want to change that to something else, I can do that right here. I can also split up jumps longer than 12 millimeters. And here's where I auto split my satins so that I don't run into that problem where there's a big gap. Um, where it's too long for the stitch. So I will do it about seven millimeters, which is really as long as you want a satin to go in most cases, uh, because it'll get snagged and pulled on. And that's about a quarter of an inch. That's a good length. Um, above that, it will split, like it did on our first sample with the satin stitch. You and Ms. Also, Tamara, I'm going to uh, introduce, I'm just going to interrupt just a second, because one of our questions, and I think you're answering it, is what is a split satin? So you're really addressing that question now, right? Yes, yes. This is a split satin. And you can set that up. Um, let's close out of here for a second. If I wanted this to be a random split, then I'm going to go into my column or satin properties, and I'm going to say make it random so it looks more like a full satin, but it's not. It's got that split. You can see where the indentations are there in the, in the stitch. Okay, so that answers that one. Um, let's go back into our general options and look at the machine. And these are just other um, options that you have if you want to remove stitches that are shorter than two millimeters, um, sometime, or 0.2 millimeters. That is a teeny tiny stitch, and it's probably a good idea to have that checked. Uh, combine jumps when it's reading, so if it's jumping, um, more than once, it combines those, so um, you don't really see that. Uh, the frame out location. This is something that's used a lot in commercial um, digitizers, and I really haven't tested it with the newer machines to see if it works, if they will read a frame out command. What a frame out means is you can have the hoop, it's, kind of, it's a stop, and the hoop on the pantograph, you know, where you hook it onto your machine, will move either to the top, to the bottom, to the left, or to the right. Now, this is done in commercial embroiderers. They'll have it move to the bottom or the front when they are, uh, unless they've rotated the design, I suppose, when they're doing applique. So it'll move out when it's time to place the fabric. Then they'll press go, and it'll stitch the tack down. It'll move out again um, for them to trim it. So you can you can actually program those in there uh, so that if your machine will read it. And then finally, your presser foot size. If you're using hoops that are <coughs> smaller, um, actually, you can, with almost everything except uh, the magna hoops that are in the uh, hoop options. If you're using a frame that's smaller than your what your machine thinks you're stitching on, then you need to input a presser foot size there so that the foot will not hit the edge of your frame. Okay, that really doesn't have anything to do unless you're using regular magna hoop, and then you just need to 
measure your foot size. So you can find that in the manual on how to do that. Okay, so let's um, oh, let's look at these things as well while we're here. The highlight section, you want to change your colors to, if you don't ever use hot pink, it's a good color to select for when you highlight something. Uh, show property tabs as icons, on-screen text typing, show the tool tip in input mode, so whenever you're inputting something, you know what mode you're in. You can also show a crosshair, uh, use cur cursors optimized for scale to scale. Play. And here's where you got to see the thickness of the bean stitch um, and the double run in 3D view when we were doing the run stitch. Okay, so those are the basic things that you want to look at with your um, options under tools. Then you can always change any of those individually as you go, but that sets up your default for while you're working. Now let's open up a new page and move to the steel stitch. The steel stitch is a lot like a run stitch, except, and here I'm curving it by holding down the control key, and now I'm not curving it. All right, a steel stitch is a satin stitch. That is, um, the inset on it is 50%. Here's my default width of 2.5. My angle, um, I can go from minus 10 to 10. So it's going to follow pretty much with the angle of the, of the stitches uh, as they're laid out. And I can also change my density, that scary word that just means the distance between the stitches. And we can see that very easily right here. I've got it at a 0.5 density, so it's a half a millimeter apart, each one of the points on those stitches. If I scroll in here and we look at it closer, let's change that to um, a one point. So we're doubling it. You see how these moved apart further. Um, now if we go back to point two, they're going to be extremely close together. And then we'll go back to our default of point five. Whoops, not point, point five. That does not work. Point five does and click Apply. Okay, so that's our default for it. If we want a heavier stitch, we can do that. We can also change the width of the stitch right here. Uh, the other thing that you have the option on is you see this corner, let's look at it in 3D. This corner right here is a squared corner. Because it's less than a 45 degree angle, I'm going to change that to an extended corner. And what happens there is it points it out. So you can use this um, when you're doing applique because if you're doing a satin applique, it's basically a steel stitch that's going around it. Uh, so that's one of your options with the applique. Now, once we get into um, satins and steel stitches, we also have another feature here called underlay. Now, in this particular one, it's giving me a center line underlay, which is right here. And it's giving me zigzag underlay, okay, which goes over it here. I can change how that underlay looks. If I don't want the zigzag underlay, I can remove it. Or I can put in parallel underlay. So it just does one uh, row of zigzag. So I guess it's just a zig and not a zag. I could do contour, uh, which just follows the whole pattern around. But let's go back to zigzag. Here I can change the density of my zigzag stitches. So if I want to make those further apart, like five millimeters, I can do that. And it will change them. Let's take it off of 3D view so you can see it. Here's the before and here's the after. Okay, so it spreads out those stitches a little bit more. Underlay is used for a lot of things. Um, Underlay, and depending on the stitches, there's no underlay with run stitches. Um, there are with satin, and there's no underlay with manual stitches. There are with satin stitches and fill stitches, uh, depending on the type of fill, and uh, different things like that. It's used for a couple of things. It's used to actually have the fabric grab the uh, stabilizer if it's not fused on. Um, it'll pick up that stabilizer when it comes around and hold it while it's going through the stitching process. 
It also secures the fabric to the stabilizer so it moves less when you're stitching it. So you might see a lot more underlay under a knit fabric than you would under something that you're stitching on just a plain woven cotton fabric. It will determine how that's done. It used to be um, that you, well, it still is, that you can use underlay to build up an area or hold down an area underneath the top stitching. For, exa for example, if this is going on a towel, I'm going to want that underlay to have um, as almost as close a density as my stitches are because that will just hold that nap down inside my towel under those stitches much better. So I could make my density, uh, oh, let's even do a one point and click apply. Now you see that it's very, very close together, um, almost like the other one. I can also change the length of it and, and all of that and the inset. So if I want it really close to that and just have the top stitch go over it and have a beautiful satin stitch, that's the way to do it. And we'll talk more about underlay as we, as we go on. Okay, so that's the steel stitch. Uh, you know, Nancy, is there any other questions before I start on the complex fill? Um, I do have a question on the complex fill, but we'll wait on that. So okay. um, there, there's a couple of things, if, if you don't mind answering those. And sure. Um, why would I want a trim rather than a jump between colors with that Mary Abel? A trim why, within a, the same color? Why would I want a trim rather than a jump between oh, well, colors? I'll tell you one reason why I use it a lot. In fact, let me show you a real good idea here in my design library. Um, and this shows you how we can do trims in, scroll down, in, with text, trims and color changes. Oh, I just lost it. Where'd you go? There we go. Okay, so here's a recipe towel. Now with this one, I've set it up. Let me ungroup it so we can look at just the text part. Ungroup. And so I've set it up in my um, text. And I'm going to, here in text and in commands, my text commands, I can have um, it change colors or input a trim after characters, words, or lines. Okay. Now, I want it after every line, even though I'm doing them in the same color, because I don't want that jump stitch coming back and then it's stitching over it and having to undo, you know, where that jump stitch has been caught by my new stitches. If um, these were further apart, that wouldn't make any difference. But if they're close together, then you see I want that to be a jump stitch there rather than it stitching back over that part of my design. Now, if I switch that to do it after every word or character, oh my goodness, I'm going to be here till forever. Um, stitching this because it will tie off and tie on between every single letter or every single word um, as it goes through. So this would take um, <laughs> a really, really long time to, to stitch. So depending on what you're doing, um, I like on something like this to make it per line so I don't worry about that jump stitch getting caught on the top. Uh, if I don't have a trim on my machine, which one of them I don't, I can make it a color change after every line, and then it will stop at the end of the line. So I can trim the top thread, and then I press go, and it stitches the next line. It's a little bit more cumbersome, but it works. So, so you see now every line has a different color change. So regardless it. of what machine you have, the software will work. Yes. Oh. Good point. Yes, very good point. I can make it work for, for my machine. Software is really a, a great equalizer as far as capabilities are concerned. So if your machine doesn't do it, you can get the software to do it for you. All right. Let's go back over um, to our complex fill. And I'm going to select this fill. And I can draw something. I could... Um, Make it really obtuse. Is that a word? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think it looks kind of like an overdone turkey leg. Uh, 
So what happens with the complex fill? Let's look at our properties. Here it's a standard fill. And in the standard fills, I have these different options. If I want it to look like it has stripes on it, I can do that. Kind of gives that look to it there. All right. Um, I also can change my stitch length. So if I want it to have a longer stitch length so more thread shows on top, I could make that even a, a 4.5 or 5. I can adjust my density as well. So the rows of stitching will be either further apart or closer together. If I make this density a two point, you're going to see that they're really far apart. Kind of gives you like a grid effect, which if you're going for that, that's kind of cool. But if you're not, then you'll want to make it closer together, like the default of 0.5 or depending on what you're stitching on. And I will take it back to the default. Now, other things that, um, other types of fills that we have, actually, let's do the underlay on this before we go to other types of fills. I'm going to click on the underlay key right here, and it tells me, based on um, the default set up in the machine, that it's going to give this a perpendicular underlay. But perhaps I don't want perpendicular, I want a full lattice, a lattice which goes diagonally, or a full lattice which would really, really um, lock that down. If I'm going over corduroy or towels or something where, or where I want to add a little more loft to my um, fill, I can do it with my underlay. I can also do an edge travel where it goes around the edge of the design as well. So all of those things and let's take it off of 3D view. You can see the underlay a little bit better under there. Okay. Now, um, that's just a standard fill underlay. If I change my fill to a different type, like emboss, and we have all of these beautiful embossed uh, fills that we can apply to something. Let's do that one. And here, my, it's keeping my stitch length the same and my density the same because I've changed it. Um, let's see what that looks like in 3D. Okay, let's back up. Oh, there. That's kind of pretty. Um, you can also, let's go back to a 3.5 um, stitch length and try a different one and apply that. It's thinking about it. Okay, and there's that. Um, embossed underlay. Now, for those of you who may not recall or maybe didn't know, you can create your own embossed fills, but we're not going to do that tonight. So, um, let's move on to some other types of fills. The motif fill. These are the same motifs that we did a run stitch with. So, we could pick up one of these and change it to, oh, that kind of looks like scales, doesn't it? And again, this follows the pattern. Now you notice the underlay is gone um, because with a motif, you don't want to see that underlay underneath there. Um, I could uh, just take it off here as well, but it knows with the underlay that you don't need that. Let's go back over to our fill. We can play with some other options and apply. And now on the fills, it's pattern length. It's not stitch length. It will recalculate the stitches based on the pattern. So we can make this a really large pattern. We can double the size of it. And that's kind of cool. We can also do the 3D effect that we talked about before. And it kind of makes it jump out at you a little bit. Maybe the pattern's too big for that. We can certainly adjust the, the size of it. Now you get a little bit more of that depth with the 3D view um, or not, or the 3D effect. 3D view is over here, so that shows you what it looks like more realistically with stitches. And then 3D effect is um, what you can do with your motif stitches. Another stitch option is the shape fill. This one's really fun, and I like to play with it. And you can make your own shapes. Uh, let's, do, let's do the star and click Apply.
and see how. Now see, this is very close together, okay? I've got a density of 2, a stitch length of 5. If I change my density to 7 so it's further apart, I'm going to see that star a little bit more. You can also select over here the Shape tool. What the Shape tool does, you can edit your outlines and the center portion of a shape. So if I want the center of that star to be over here, that's all I have to do is move it. Okay? Um, and again, it's uh, by stitch length and density, or the distance between those rows of stitching. Another option is contour, which simply follows the shape of the outline. Now on this one, you can put these closer together. Let's do a 0.5 and change our stitch length. Well, we can leave it at 5 and get a totally different effect. I could even do a 0.2. And now it, it almost has a look of, of cruel work, you know, where you go around and around. Um, I wouldn't recommend that on this shape of <laughs> design, but it does work. And then, of course, we have stippling. And you can change the distance between your rows of stippling um, just by changing the density. So if you want to do micro stippling, you can and apply that. And we do actually have three types of stippling now. We have the maze. We have piano, which is more like this. If I change my stitch length, I'll get rid of those pointy curves. Let's make it a three or even a two and apply. So now it's more curvy. And then we have Hilbert. Now I don't know where Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Um, let me shrink this thing back down. Okay, so Hilbert, <laughs> um, maybe Hilbert did that. Um, let's, it, it's just your typical, you know, meandering around stippling. Don't know where the name came from, but if you want to make it really big, you know, just to get through it, you can change the density. And there you go. So. Uh, now, the next thing with, uh, with our fill types is the wave stitch. Let's make our density a little closer together, and we can make our stitch length a little bigger, and click Apply. Now, the wave stitch is really fun. You can either do it separated like this, or you could put them closer together. But you see this line going through it. This is your curved line. So I can take and change the angle of my curve just like that. I could also, let's, since we're in, we're in the Shape tool, I can right-click on it and add a point. So if I want another curve option here, I can do that. Then just right-click to set it. So you see, you can really get some fun effects with that. Um, and it really gives you a lot of dimension. So use that one as you want to. And that is all of our standard fill, or all of our, our complex fills. I want to go back to the standard fill now, and we can do, we'll do brick, and set it at a standard stitch length, and show you uh, some other things. When I select this with my shape uh, tool, it shows me my angle line. I can change my angle line wherever I want that. And this is why it's important. When we go into our settings, not our settings, and when we go into our push and pull compensation, this goes in the direction of the angle line because this is the way it's stitching. So when it um, pulls, it's going to pull in in this direction. So if I set up um, a percentage or an absolute pull compensation, and 
And you don't have to worry about this when you're manually digitizing. If you want to set it to a particular type of fabric, you can just go through the click to stitch stitch processing, and it will set an absolute or uh, percentage um, uh, pull compensation for you. So let's say I want to do it two millimeters on both sides, and I click Apply. Now, you see what happens. Let me, with the shape tool selected, here's our original design. That's the shape that it was. When you use the pull compensation, it will push that up the other direction. So I'm going out on either side um, in the direction of my stitching. All right. Then um, we can also do um, both sides and apply a push compensation of an absolute value of we're just going to make it wild here. Let's do, so you can see it better, six millimeters, which is kind of crazy. And what that does is where it pulls in as it's stitching out, or, or it pushes out as it's stitching in, it makes up for that. So that's also going to be done along the stitching line. If you ever have those designs where you think this, the outline stitching is a little bit off, like if this pink stitching was an outline and it's a little bit off in some places but not in other. That is probably because of pull or push compensation and you should uh, stitch it out on the fabric and see how it stitches before you go adjust all the outlines around all of those characters that you spend hours doing and then it stitches out wrong because they had push and pull compensation built into the design. So that's uh, your compensation, then of course, you know, you'd want to add your underlay there if you need it. And um, our settings, oh, the other thing we can do on this, our general settings, so we can change the endpoints here. Instead of being chiseled, we can make those square, okay? Chiseled gives you a little finer effect, but if you're getting too much you're not getting the, the line that you want around the edge of your design, you can change um, the type of connection on the end, whether it's chiseled or squared. And then your chisel distance, uh, this is 0.4 millimeters, so that's you know, 4 tenths of a millimeter. Overlap lines. This is where, let's take this design, let me just select it. Let's just go through a slow redraw and see how it stitches out. Okay, so you see it's doing, that's the under, underlay. Now it's going to come here. Oh, okay, that's what I wanted to show you. When these two meet back here, your overlap is the are the rows of stitches that where it, where it overlaps. Either you don't overlap or you overlap right here, or you overlap lines one line, okay, so that it won't look like a definite break there. And that is the default. Gradient fill we can also do. We can do linear increasing, decreasing, convex, and concave. Um, and you want to put your maximum density in there. Let's do convex and apply so you can see Here's what happens, and that was really wide. Let's make our, back in settings, make our density not so big. We'll make it a one point. So now it's, you see it's a little bit more uh, filled in the center because we did concave. Okay. Now, um, Nancy, what other questions do we have? Uh, Nancy is, will be right with you. Oh, okay. Um, do we have any other questions from the group here other than the one that I saw that was, um, do you have any idea of the cutting needles on uh, embroidery machines? Do they yeah. cut? They yes. Cut? What they, uh -huh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, can you buy them? Yes, you can. Um, I know certain machines manufacture them um, as either an 
multi-needle machines have them as well as single needle machines. Uh, Bernina's is a little bit different than most for those of you who have a Bernina. It's actually a dial uh, where it, it moves the needle. They're cut, they're, there's four different directions that they're cut in. And let me show you real quick here. Let's create an outline around here and let's get rid, actually, let's get rid of our fill. Um, okay, so here's our outline. I'm going to convert it to a run stitch and then convert that to cut work and click apply. Now you see all those jump stitches. Let's take it off of 3D. If we go through a slow redraw here, and I haven't saved it so it hasn't divided it into colors or, or put the stops in, but once I save it into a stitch file, it will set that for that um, format. So first it's going to see how it's jumping. It's doing the same angle and then it will start doing the next angle. Okay, that's why all the jump stitches, but you're not going to have any jump stitches because you're not using thread. The needles have a little wedge on the end of them that allow it to penetrate and it's, it's like, um, like a wedge tool that, you, you know, you would hammer to get uh, a mark, you know, through wood or in this case um, to cut through fabric. And there's four different directions that it goes. It'll do the first direction, then the second, then the third one. Then the, when it does the fourth one, everything is cut out. So they're single needles. You can get them single needles in a set of four, or with the Bernina, it's, it's one um, that's rotated as the colors change. So, um, but check those out because they're really, they're fun to use. Does that Thank answer you. the question? Yes, it did, and I thank okay. you so much. You're Nancy welcome. Nancy is with us. Okay, and I have one more thing that I want to show you in terms of, of terms, and we will have a webinar just on artwork because it's so fabulous and it does so many things. Oh, the horses are coming. <laughs> I don't know what that noise is. Uh, in artwork, I can select to create artwork, a rectangle and an ellipse, a triangle and a diamond. If I hold my control key down while I drag my cursor, it will make a perfect square. If I don't, I can make that any kind of rectangle I want. You can also, the properties that you have with artwork, you can fill it or not. So that's entirely up to you. But once you get, you know, and here's a tip for those of you who want to play around with creating different things. Once you get either your artwork or a complex fill um, to a, something to an artwork or complex fill, you can, you can convert it to almost anything. If I right click on here and say convert to, I can make it a run, a satin, a steel, a complex fill, cross stitch, applique, puffy stitch, or tackle twill. So very easy. I'm going to make this an applique. And you can see, barely, it puts in, in my applique, my placement line and my tack down line. I can determine how close uh, my tack down, what my tack down offset is from my placement line. Um, again, I've got the extended and square corners, but these are such that they're not smaller than 45 degrees, so it wouldn't apply to them. My applique density. And I can change the angle of it a little bit. My inset is 50%. But I can come up here and change this from a satin applique to uh, an E-stitch, which is a blanket stitch, or a motif stitch, or a symbol stitch. So, um, and then all of those properties apply with the stitch length and the pattern length. And um, then you've still got your placement and all of that. So very easy to convert to and from different things. Now when this is artwork, let's see, convert to artwork. I can take it back to my artwork. And we fill this one. Let's fill it just so you can see. And I fill this one. But I'm going to change the color on it by right clicking on the red. And then click fill and apply. Let's look at our sequence view. Okay. Oh, we have two artworks there. What's the other one? Let's Oh, that's probably an outline. Yeah, let's just delete that. Okay, so now when I have two objects, I have other things that are open to me, and this is true with a complex fill as well. 
I'm going to select them both. And now you see I can trim the selected paths, so whichever one's on top will remove that hole from underneath, like that, uh, which is similar to removing overlap uh, if this was a complex fill, but it's actually doing it right at the edge there instead of giving me um, a, an allowance for compensation or for overlap of my stitching areas. Now if I select them again, let's undo that so that, let's make sure, yes, we're back where we were. Okay, now I can do by selecting both of them. I can also do a weld to make them one, okay, so they're, they're hooked together. I can undo that. Let's undo, oh, there we are. Uh, I can, with both of them selected, I can also do an intersect. So it just gives me where they intersected. Now let's take that one and I'm going to duplicate it. Let's put one here. Oop, there we go. Ms. Hammer, why would you duplicate rather than copy? Because with duplicate, I click duplicate once, and then wherever I left click, it'll just put it there. So I don't have to do copy paste all of that. It will just line it up for me. Now, if it I want this the property, pardon? It does not change the property. No, it doesn't. It duplicates it exactly the same size and everything. I could also, if I, that's if I just click, if I do a duplicate, I can also pull it out, make it really big, <laughs> or make it small and rotate it when I do it. So that's quicker than, you know, um, copy, paste, rotate, resize. I can just duplicate if I want several of them out there. Now, let me show you something here. If I select all of these, and align them, vertically center. Here's what this tool does. It's going to distribute them evenly, horizontally. Oh, that is wonderful. Yeah, and you can get the same effect if you distribute vertically if they were going the other way. So, or if I had two rows of them, uh, I could distribute vertically. If I want to, uh, let's do, let's make this one smaller. I want to show you what the combine feature does. And I can even make it a different color. Oh, we're looking Christmassy here. If I combine things, and you can combine two things, uh, I click combine, and it's like um, where you trim, but you don't have to delete that other thing. I'm combining these two things into one. So whichever's on top is going to eat through whatever's on bottom, kind of like a cookie cutter in dough. And I could put any shape on there I want to. Um, and it could be, you know, if I want a triangle cut out of this one. Let's, there it's selected. Let's change the color so you can see it. And it doesn't have to be a solid fill, but I combine it and it cuts through it. So there's a lot of, of fun things with that. You can also do your outline. Let's do create outline where you can put it outside of the original one and that comes in as artwork. Um, you can do those multiple times. It's lots of stuff. So um, other questions before we start to wrap um, the up? The only other question is, is again, when you weld an item, uh -huh. Stitches beneath are removed, correct? Yes. Let's turn this into stitches and let me show you. Um, here, I'll make this uh, convert to a complex fill. Let's just get rid of these. Delete. All right. So here's my complex fill, and this is really small. I'm going to make it much larger. By coming into transform, I'm going to change this to um, a width of three inches. Okay, now I have my fill. I'm going to bring in um, another shape. Let's do a diamond. And I'm going to convert that to stitches to a complex fill. 
and let's change the color so we can see it. Now, the difference between if I uh, do a weld here, select both of them and weld, it's going to make it into one object. Okay. Oops, what did I do there? Let's undo. Select both of them and trim. It will remove what's sorry, what's underneath the green square for diamond. Okay. If I were to weld those, let's undo. If I were to weld those, whoop, it's still not undone. Let's undo. Okay, now they're solid. Um, if I want to weld those, it makes it a single object like that. However, let's undo that. If I combine them, it's a little different. It puts those together. Combine actually removes wherever they're overlapped. So it's a little bit different type of function. And then if you want to break that up, it's just like going back to where you were, only it doesn't change your color back. Thank okay. you so much, Tamara. Oh, and remove overlap. When you remove overlap, you only select the one item. So the one on top, right click, and there's where you remove your overlap. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, I didn't select the top one. Oh, let's remove overlap here. Oh. Now, now I've got two little triangles under there. So, okay, what other questions, Dory? Um, we don't have many left. Uh, you've okay. got a lot of awesome presentations, but I will tell you, first of all, Nancy would like to apologize. She had technical diff difficulties. That's okay. And, um, we had absolutely a fantastic um, experience with the questions. Thank you so much for everybody for joining. Thank you, Nancy. Um, be, be sure to see our next webinar. In this two weeks. One, the next one that's coming on up. Do you want to talk about that for a sec? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'll keep my mouth shut and let you do it. Sorry. No, 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 no. That's okay. <laughs> it's coming up on November the 4th, and... I think that one's on hooping, or on the quilting software. Um, what happens in the hoop stays in the hoop, if I'm not mistaken. So right. you're right. It'll be fun. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for coming, and for those that had technical difficulties as well, please check with the GoToWebinar people and see if you can uh, find out where your difficulties came from. I want to thank again Nancy, Chris, Bob, and Debbie, and of course Nancy Schneider who is dealing with the technical difficulty. <laughs> and Tamara, thank you so much for again oh, showing thank you, Dory. all the wonderful tools in Perfect Embroidery Pro. Thank you very much. Y'all have a good evening. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone. Good night.